Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue thinking about streams and flooding. So in this video we're going to look at some of the features that characterise low gradient streams and this is going to correspond to section 16.8 of your textbook. So once we enter low gradient rivers we will tend to see a change in the type of river system that we get. As we've discussed in higher elevation areas, so areas that have a steep gradient, we are more likely to get braided river systems. These will consist of multiple channels all running approximately parallel to each other and these channels will tend to be quite wide but not that deep. Now, in contrast, what we have when we move into a lower gradient system is we have a shift from a multi-channel system, so the braided river system, to a single channel system. And this, you know, the most common type of single channel system that we'll see will be a meandering river. So the first question we want to address is, why do we see a single channel? Well, it's all to do with the type of material that our river is moving through. So, in the case of a braided river system, our river is moving through material which is very poorly consolidated. It's really loose. You could pick it up with your hands. So, this means the river, which is quite powerful, has the ability to erode and transport away material at will. And so this means the river can quite literally punch whatever path it wants because it has the power and the material it has to erode to, to take the path it wants is relatively weak and poorly consolidated, so it can do that. In contrast, a meandering river system is moving through an environment where we have lots and lots of clay and silt in the sediment. And clay and silt-rich sediments are often very, very dense, very, very robust, sticky material. If you ever try to dig a hole in you know, slightly damp, very clay-rich soil, you will know that it takes a lot of effort to do that. And that's because the clay particles, the clay minerals within the soil are naturally very cohesive. They want to stick together. And that produces a very cohesive soil, which is actually surprisingly difficult to erode. So what happens is, is the water which is traveling you know, downstream using our river will begin to be channeled into one channel. And that's simply because rather than having multiple channels all trying to do their own thing, the most energy efficient way of moving the water is to put it all into one channel and let that channel take the path of least resistance. So the river will you know, find whatever the easiest route is and that will be the starting point for our meandering river system. Now, we've already gone and discussed how meandering river systems have quite a highly sinuous uh, pathway, and this is going to obviously lead to the formation of meanders. And so we will see the uh, formation of point bars in the cores of our meanders and cutbacks along the outer edge of our meanders. And we've already discussed why that is. Now, either side of our meandering river channel, we're going to have a floodplain. So our floodplain will typically have quite a gentle gradient, and that's a reflection of the environment in which the river is located. Typically, most meandering river systems are located in areas where the gradient has naturally become quite low. So there's not a very quick drop in terms of the topography. And this explains why the water in our river system will often have less energy, because the smaller the drop, the less energy our river will have. Now, what is also going to happen is if there are any topographic depressions in our floodplain, or on our floodplain, should I say, they will naturally be filled in over time with sediment that gets deposited when our river floods. And so what this will do is it will end up producing a floodplain, which typically has a very gentle gradient because that's the area that the river's in, but it will also be surprisingly flat because any imperfections in the floodplain, especially depressions, will be filled in with sediment every time the river floods and eventually those depressions will be smoothed out. Now either side of our meandering river system it's not uncommon to have terraces and terraces are areas of raised ground and we can see one here and the matching terrace over here. Now terraces either side of our floodplain will often have the same height and the reason for that is is that these terraces represent the land uh, the land level in the past. So this you know, once upon a time our floodplain didn't exist and essentially our terrace was connected so you could walk from here all the way over to here without the floodplain being there. Now where's the floodplain come from? Well we know that most of the erosion which is done by meandering river systems is lateral so it's all to do with the river moving across the floodplain from left to right. 
However, there will also be a small amount of downward erosion as well. Now, over time, what this means is, is as our river moves across our floodplain, it will also steadily be eroding downwards. And so over time, the rock that was here has been steadily eroded away by the river until, until we reach our modern floodplain level. Now, this means the ground surface either side of our river, which once upon a time was complete, obviously gets cut by the floodplain, the river valley, and so we end up forming a terrace on this side and a terrace on this side. And as I say, these terraces will have the same level because they were both part of the same land surface in the past. Now, because we have meanders, we are also going to see uh, meander scars, cutoffs, and oxbow lakes forming uh, on the floodplain. And in the next slide, we're actually going to cover these in greater detail. So okay, so here's a shot of a river in slightly higher resolution. Once again, you can see it's a meandering river. We can see it's very sinuous. We can see the main channel here. And of course, we remember that these curves in our rivers are termed meanders. So when we look at our picture, what kind of things can we see? Well, obviously, first of all, we have several meanders. So we obviously have a meander here, a meander here, one here, one here, and so on. Now, we know that on the inner edge of our meander, the water slows down as it moves through the core. Now, as we've discussed, this means as the water slows down, it loses energy. When it loses energy, that means it's going to have to start to deposit, deposit any sediment that it can no longer transport. And so in this area, in the core of our meander, we're going to have slowing water, and this is going to lead to the deposition of the coarsest sediments that our river is moving, which will typically be fine and medium sands. Now, on the outer edge of our meander, we're going to have a cutback. So the cutback is produced by the fact that the water on the outer edge of our meander has to speed up. And as the water speeds up, it gains energy. And because it gains energy, it increases the capacity of that water to erode. And so this means that what happens is, is the outer edge of our meander, the outer bank, starts to get eroded away. And this leads to the formation of a near vertical bank surface along the outer edge of our meanders. And this is referred to as a cutback. Now, we are also going to see cut off meanders within our river system. So as you can see, we have a meander right here. We actually have one that's coming around like so. And we actually have another one right here. We actually have three separate meanders, which are all cut off one here, one here, and one here. So this is a very complicated area. But nevertheless, let's focus on this meander right here. Well, this meander you can see is still attached to the main channel. So it's considered to be a cutoff meander rather than an oxbow lake because there is still water moving from the main channel into the meander itself. Now, once the, uh, the stream, the, the channel fills up here and here with sediment and the meander gets cut off, it's going to form an oxbow lake. But for the time being, this is simply a cutoff meander where the neck of the meander has been cut by the main channel of the river, but the meander itself is still attached to that main channel. Now, over time, our uh, cutoff meanders will eventually become oxbow lakes like this lake over here. And then over time, our oxbow lakes will steadily fill up with sediment and eventually the oxbow lake will be completely lost. It will just be completely filled with sediment. And when this happens, what we will have left are what we refer to as meander scars. And these are areas of the floodplain where a meander used to be, but the uh, cutoff meander and the oxbow lake that forms has have been filled in with sediment. And all we can see is we can just make out the light trace of the meander on the land surface. So we can see there was a meander there in the past, but it's been completely infilled with sediment now. Now, going back to our cutoff meander, over time what's going to happen is obviously the water is going to continue moving mostly through the main channel, and this cutoff meander itself is going to become a relatively low energy environment. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have a buildup of sediment at one end of our meander and a buildup of sediment at the other end of our meander. And eventually this buildup of sediment is going to completely separate our meander from the main channel. And of course, at this point, we're going to have ourselves an oxbow lake. And as I said, this oxbow lake will steadily fill up with sediment over time and eventually it will become completely filled with sediment, at which point all we'll be left with is a meander scar that shows us there was an oxbow lake there in the past, 
but it's no longer uh, there anymore because the lake itself has been filled in. Now, the final feature that we tend to see associated with meandering streams are levees. So what is a levee? Well, a levee is a raised embankment which is located either side of our channel. And you can see it here in this diagram, one levee coming through here and one levee coming through here. So the levees will often sit above the height of the surrounding floodplains. So they form a, a local topographic high. Now, in terms of the levee itself, we see that they are often made of very sandy material, typically fine and medium sized sands. Now, as we move away from our meander onto the floodplain proper, we begin to see the amount of sand decreasing and the sediment becoming more mud rich. So we start seeing more clay and silt sized particles. So the question becomes, well, why are our levees dominated by this very sandy material? Well, it's all to do with the process that occurs when our river floods. So in this model, you can see that our river has flooded, so the, the river water has exited the main channel, and it's now covering over the floodplain. Now, the thing is, is as soon as the river water starts to leave the channel, it will instantly begin to decelerate. It will slow down. As our water begins to slow down, it begins to lose energy. As our water begins to lose energy, it will have to deposit any sediment that it can no longer transport. So obviously it will start dropping the heaviest sediment first. And that's exactly what's happening here. As the water is leaving the main channel, the second it exits that main channel, it starts slowing down. And because it starts slowing down straight away, this leads to a you know, loss of energy. And so the heavier sediment, which in this case will be fine and medium sands, will be deposited first. So right here, right next to the river channel. Now, what's going to happen is the finer material, the clays and silts, which are held in suspension in the flood water, will continue away with the flood water itself because they're so light, they won't get deposited until the water comes to a near complete stop. And so this helps to explain, number one, why our levees are located along the margins of our river, and number two, why our levees are dominated typically by sand-sized clasts. All right, thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.